The one goal that we should definitely strive for to fulfill is to bring about the complete irreversible awakening of complete Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings whose numbers are as limitless as space is vast. So if with this motivation we were to set out to uh, study Dharma, to practice Dharma, we should also set out with this motivation now to listen to the instructions upon that profound path as it has been taught by the incomparable Daku Rinpoche or Gampopa, namely his instructions from the so-called jewel ornament of liberation. Yesterday we have uh, reached to the third of the four basic fundamental instructions that we could receive from our spiritual friends. This third one, which deals with our giving rise to loving kindness and compassion towards all beings, is the antidote against our possible hope of finding peace and happiness within this cycle of, uh, uh, of uh, life, of uh, existence, solely for our own sakes. And yesterday we heard an explanation about loving kindness, the how and what, and this was summarized into six points, namely the, uh, uh, the categorization, the uh, characteristics, the objects, the ways this is being employed, and so forth. And since loving kindness and compassion come together as one, uh, the categorization and so forth for the explanation of compassion are the same, even the root verse that uh, deals with this uh, sounds the same. It's uh, using very much the same words. <laughs> Dunay, 
Now, as we have heard already concerning loving kindness, so it goes on <coughs> the same kind of categorization uh, in terms of compassion. Now, first to the categorization. When we talk about compassion, again, there are three types of compassion. The first type of compassion is the compassion that arises within us uh, while looking at the suffering of beings itself. The second type of compassion focuses upon the individual characteristics of beings. And the third type of compassion is the so-called objectless compassion, compassion that is free of any reference point. Referring to the first type of compassion, it is the kind of compassion that arises within ourselves when we perceive that which we truly characterize as suffering, when we <coughs> feel all kinds of pain, of sickness, all kinds of discomfort, as we uh, uh, seem to experience it again and again in our lives, uh, and uh, when we also see such suffering in, us, in, in others. It is the kind of compassion that is being based on our holding this suffering, this pain that seemingly exists, as uh, truly existent. It is the kind of compassion that arises within us when we think that all of that which we characterize as suffering, as pain and so forth, is uh, truly happening, is truly existent. And uh, it is the kind of compassion that most of us have uh, uh, at times experienced or give rise to. The second type of compassion, that which focuses upon the characteristics of beings, is the kind of compassion that uh, uh, is being described in the, uh, the uh, first turning of the wheel of the Dharma by the Buddha that is being described in his uh, first uh, cycle of teachings, where he uh, goes uh, into great detail about explaining how we constantly find ourselves within this cycle of existence under the influence of our own karma, of uh, why we constantly uh, experience, suffer the results of our own deeds and uh, therefore uh, give rise to uh, the uh, idea that uh, such experiencing is full of pain, is full of suffering and uh, therefore one wants to get rid of it, one wants to uh, rid oneself of this by various means. And the third type of compassion pertains to those, uh, the objectless or uh, compassion or the compassion which is free of any <coughs> reference point, pertains to those who have already uh, achieved, who are practicing the path of the greater vehicle, the Mahayana, and who are, have already achieved a certain insight. It is the kind of compassion that arises in those uh, practitioners, those beings who dwell on the uh, bodhisattva stages, uh, who have already fully understood that that which seemingly appears and exists does not have any inherent self-nature onto itself or by itself. Nevertheless, it is being said that uh, even though they have come to understood that which we uh, up until now term suffering, which we label as suffering, as pain and so forth, uh, that uh, this is not truly existent whatsoever. So therefore their compassion is said to be limitless or uh, their compassion is also said to be free of any object or free of any reference point. But this kind of compassion is said to be a much stronger compassion than any other kind of compassion could be. It is called limitless compassion and it pertains to those it is being uh, exhibited by those who are dwelling on the Bodhisattva Bhumis who have fully understood the true nature of appearances and phenomena. So when in this way we speak of these three types of compassion, this also pertains to three types of individual. The first type of compassion is the compassion which ordinary beings like ourselves experience, which ordinary beings like ourselves can exhibit towards others. The second kind of uh, compassion uh, pertains to those who would be practitioners of the Shravaka and Prajeka Buddha path. However, this refers to all practitioners of all the various traditions of, uh, uh, of um, uh, Buddhism, not only to those of the lesser vehicle, the Hinayana. And the third type of compassion, the compassion that is free of any particular reference point, is the compassion that is being exhibited by the exalted bodhisattvas, the uh, beings which dwell on the bodhisattva bhumis who have fully understood and recognized the true empty nature of all phenomena and appearance.
appearances. Now to the next five points, which follow after the categorization of the various types of compassion. The next would be the objects of, mid of, of, of our uh, compassion. And the objects of our compassion are all sentient beings, not a single one excluded. This is rather simple, there's nothing much more to be said about this. Uh, it includes, of course, all of those whom are, who are dear to us, all of those who are, love, who are loved ones of ours, friends and so forth. It also includes those uh, uh, whom we do not like, those whom we could possibly even call enemies. And it also includes those uh, uh, for whom we have no particular feeling at all, whom uh, we uh, view in a completely neutral way. In this way, uh, our compassion, the, the objects are of our compassion are all of these sentient beings without excluding a single one. What is the characteristic or the uh, particular, uh, how is uh, compassion then characterized? It is said that compassion is the wish to, that uh, all sentient beings may be free of suffering and that they may be free of uh, any causes for future suffering. Now, looking at this, uh, we know that all beings, of course, desire happiness and want to uh, uh, avoid suffering, yet they are ignorant about the means which bring about such happiness, which avoid such suffering. Therefore, in their constant endeavor to uh, achieve happiness and to be free of suffering, they constantly go wrong and produce yet more suffering and again more suffering. Therefore, that being the case, our recognizing this, we give rise to great compassion to them. Now, giving rise to such compassion, it is said uh, um, how, to what extent can such uh, compassion be practiced? Can it be uh, practiced by us? The extent, the maximum extent of such compassion towards all beings is that uh, we practice it in such a way that uh, at a certain point there is not a single thought of selfishness left within ourselves. That when our each and every action um, is being performed for the sake of others and uh, completely disregarding our own sake, this is the extent to which compassion can be practiced, to which it can be displayed towards beings. And what are the uh, benefits of such compassion or how are the benefits? Well, the benefits of such compassion are completely limitless. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Then 
So when we're talking about giving rise to uh, passion and uh, loving kindness, when we talk about bodhicitta as such, the enlightened attitude, the awakened heart, then most people seem to think that simply giving rise to loving kindness and compassion and uh, displaying these towards uh, beings in whichever way, that this in itself is already bodhicitta. Well, that is not entirely correct. So, if we were to familiarize ourselves with uh, uh, how to give rise to bodhicitta and what bodhicitta truly is, then it uh, would, uh, we, we could, for instance, look at the particular way as a, such explanation has been handed down in the Kadampa tradition as it has been taught originally by the great master Atisha. He explains the giving rise to bodhicitta, the significance of bodhicitta, in seven points. The first point of these is that we remind ourselves of the fact, or that we come to recognize the fact, that all beings, not a single one excluded, in one lifetime or another have invariably been our mothers. Well, that in itself does not yet produce any particular love or compassion within us. Therefore, we move on to the second point, in which we reflect <coughs> upon the fact that while these beings have been our mothers, they have been immeasurably kind to us. Thinking about this in this way, we move on to the third of these seven steps, uh, during which, uh, in, in which we think that uh, now the time has come for us to repay that kindness. Having received such loving kindness and com loving kindness uh, uh, from our loving mothers, at a certain point in time, we <laughs> might feel that uh, the time for repaying such kindness has come. That brings us then to the, uh, the fourth point, which in itself gives rise to love or loving kindness towards these. And having given rise to such loving kindness, we move on then to the uh, giving rise to compassion itself. These two would then be steps <coughs> four and five. The sixth point is then that which is called the immaculate wish, the immaculate intention which we give rise to. For instance, if we were to think that um, practicing loving kindness and compassion, generosity, whatever, towards beings, that in the future such beings as we uh, show ourselves kind to could repay that kindness to ourselves. If we give presents, if we give uh, uh, 
assistance of whatever kind to beings. We could possibly hope for that sometime later in the course of our lives these beings might come back to us being equally kind to us. Or we might harbor the thoughts that uh, if we are only sufficiently generous, and loving, and kind, and compassionate towards beings, that in future lifetimes then uh, we will reap the results thereof possibly as being reborn in the God drum and uh, experiencing all sorts of happiness and pleasure, or that uh, we are at least born under positive circumstances in such a way that this kindness that we have displayed towards others is being returned to us. If our, if our intention were of that kind, that would not be an immaculate uh, or a pure intention. That would be an intention that is characterized by our hope for being repaid that which we give to others. So if we would give rise to the pure intention, the immaculate wish, then our wish or intention would be completely free of any self-regard. And we would freely give, we would freely uh, express loving kindness and compassion towards being without the slightest thought of retribution, of being, um, of being repaid our own kindness. This should be our intention. And then in the final step, then in the seventh of these, uh, uh, these seven steps, then after all of this has come to pass, after all of these uh, conditions are given, then indeed we give rise to that which is called the true enlightened attitude, the true bodhicitta. These we have heard of many times as being described in two categories, there is the conventional enlightened attitude and the highest or ultimate enlightened attitude and so forth as we have so often heard about them. And within the Kadampa tradition, based on the uh, initial teaching from Atisha, these teachings have been handed down and then also subsequently been received by the incomparable Gampopa. Gampopa has worked these seven points into his jewel ornament of liberation. They may not be so explicitly mentioned, but if one were to read uh, carefully through his words, one would certainly find these seven points. <laughs> Now, Gampopa summarizes all of this in 12 points. The explanation of Bodhicitta, of the enlightened attitude. First, he says, what is bodhicitta in the first place? How does it come to pass and what kinds of bodhicitta are there? Then he goes on to ask or to explain, like, where do, uh, does such bodhicitta come from? What, uh, who is the, uh, the, uh, the, the source of such bodhicitta? How has it been taught? Then how should we practice such bodhicitta? What are the, um, uh, what are the shortcomings of uh, not practicing such bodhicitta and uh, in which way it is, be, is it being truly actualized. And then he goes on to say, if we practice such bodhicitta, what are the results thereof? What would be the shortcomings of uh, giving up practicing such bodhicitta? And what is it that has to be constantly trained in? So these 12 points, under these 12 headings, uh, Kampopo proceeds to explain bodhicitta, the enlightened attitude, in detail. <laughs> So if we were to look at the first of these 12 points, then one would first have to look at what sorts of individuals <coughs> does such uh, uh, are being characterized by such bodhicitta, by such an enlightened attitude. Generally, it is said that the 
individuals which are characterized through such an attitude are those who have the potential of the greater being, the so-called Mahayana. They are those who have also actualized this potential, not those who in some way have that potential which is still uh, which is still not, which is still slumbering with them, but who have truly actualized this uh, um, this potential, who have really brought forth the wish within themselves that they want to achieve the awakening of Buddhahood for the sake of all beings. So it needs to be actualized in this way. Then uh, there are the ways of doing so, and then there is uh, there are the conditions uh, by which uh, this is being brought forth. Again, there are. Uh, several conditions, and one of them is, uh, the third of them, is the having placed oneself under the protection of the three jewels, which is having gone for refuge. Now, this having gone for refuge, uh, again, is being uh, explained in nine points by Kampo. Everything that has, could possibly be known about uh, how to go for refuge, the benefits thereof, and so forth, is being characterized under nine points. And this first starts out by way of giving uh, rise to the wish of placing oneself under the protection of the three jewels and the various ways of doing so. Then the various uh, ways of giving rise to uh, the, uh, the wish to do so, the uh, benefits uh, thereof, the shortcomings of not doing so, and uh, the various kind of individuals and their attitudes uh, which could possibly give rise to that wish of placing themselves under such protection of bringing about of uh, going for refuge in this way and uh, proceeding uh, in this way upon the path. So altogether there are nine points, nine <coughs> headings which Kampopa uh, mentions, uh, which include uh, everything that needs to be known about the various ways of going for refuge, of placing oneself under the protection of the three jewels and the various benefits which are being derived thereof. <laughs> Sanjibu 
Now looking at his points, as Gampoba has explained them, he goes into, into detail first about the explanation of what different kinds of refuge, what different kinds of sources of protection, and what different kinds of individuals are there who go for such protection. There are, one can speak uh, generally of ordinary refuge and of, uh, of extraordinary refuge. Ordinary refuge uh, is sought by whom? It is uh, sought by those who, for whatever reason, <coughs> think that they have to put themselves under the protection of someone. Those who experience some suffering, who want to be uh, protected from such suffering, and uh, take this uh, and, and take some object uh, as their protection in the hope of being protected from the sufferings. The extraordinary refuge is that which uh, pertains to those who have uh, actualized that's this Mahayana potential that we have heard about. And when we're talking in terms of the Mahayana potential, when we're talking uh, about, um, about going for refuge, placing oneself under the protection of these three rare and precious ones, then this can come under three headings. <coughs> There's the three kinds of refuge. Initially, when we talk about these objects, there are uh, refuge objects, refuge sources as representation. If we were to uh, put up such representations, then of course we would have the Buddha, a, a form of the Buddha representing the Buddha. We would have a Dharma text representing the uh, uh, teaching of the Buddha, which is the Dharma. And we would have some sort of representation of a Bodhisattva, which uh, would represent the Sangha. Now this is the, uh, the, um, the uh, ordinary way of uh, putting them. What are they? If one were to look at them in the second step, uh, what exactly do they signify? Now, when we talk about going for refuge to the Buddha, placing ourselves under the refuge, under the protection of Buddha, then what is Buddha? Buddha is that is the <coughs> unity of the three Buddha kayas, the three Buddha bodies, which are namely the Nirmanakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Dhammakaya. The union of these three, the essence of these three, this is what Buddha is, or what Buddha means. What means Dharma in this respect? Dharma is the teaching that has been given to the Buddha. Dharma is all that which brings about a lasting end of all suffering and which brings about the achievement of the state of complete peace. This is Dharma. And Sangha, in this particular context, uh, talking about Sangha, we've, in, in this context we refer to those who dwell upon the Bodhisattva Bhumi, as they're called. We're not referring to ordinary practitioners, practitioners, but to the highly realized bodhisattvas who have already achieved certain stages of the uh, bodhisattva bhumis and uh, are in this way are called the exalted sangha. Now, looking at it from the uh, third point uh, of view, <coughs> the highest, the ultimate refuge is finally nobody else but Buddha himself. There is no necessity anymore to take refuge or put oneself under the protection of Dharma or Sangha. This is being explained in the uh, Mahayana Uttara Tantra Shastra by Maitreya and the Sangha, where uh, this text which deals with the Buddha nature itself, uh, by way of an example. If one were to cross a great ocean, if one uh, were to set out to reach uh, the land on the other side, the other shore of an ocean, one would have to avail oneself boat, and one would have to avail oneself of helpers, of those who row the boat. Those who row that boat are the Sangha. The boat itself is the Dharma. But once we have reached the other shore of that ocean, then we have no more need for neither those who row the boat nor the boat itself. Then we have, uh, uh, we have uh, come, we have achieved our goal, we have come to uh, our final destination, which is Buddha. And in such a way, then Buddha and only Buddha himself, nothing else, is our ultimate protection, our ultimate refuge. There's no more need for anything else but Buddha. <laughs> 
Which brings us to the next point, which is the time, the duration of time for which we resolve to place ourselves under the protection of the three rare and precious ones. And again, there are two, uh, uh, two kinds or two categories. If we simply were to look for protection from the sufferings of this life for the duration of this life, then we would go, to ref we would go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha for, namely, the duration of this life, <coughs> until this life ends. However, the greater, the uh, more far-reaching way of uh, placing oneself under this protection would be to resolve to go for refuge to the three jewels, to the three rare and precious ones, until we ourselves have uh, achieved complete uh, Buddhahood, the awakening of complete Buddhahood uh, for ourselves and for the sake of all beings. This brings us then to the motivation again. If we were to simply strive to achieve such uh, freedom of suffering and such uh, peace uh, for ourselves, this would be the lesser motivation, whereas if we were to strive for uh, the uh, awakening of Buddhahood for the sake of all beings, this would be the motivation as would pertain to a true practitioner of the greater vehicle of the Mahayana. 
Then to the actual method of uh, requesting and receiving refuge. Again, there are two ways. There's a general way or an ordinary and, a, and an extraordinary way. The ordinary way would be that we would simply approach a teacher having resolved to place ourselves under the uh, protection of the three jewels uh, with whatever motivation, ask for refuge, we would uh, offer some frustrations and, uh, and uh, present an offering, and then the uh, teacher would uh, simply give us this refuge, we would then proceed with the ritual, we would repeat the corresponding words, and at the end of that we would then have received such refuge. The special way, the um, the uh, uncommon way is that again we would give we would uh, go into the presence of such a master of such a teacher we would uh, perform offerings and prostrations and requests to be given the precepts of refuge placing ourselves under the protection of the three jewels and then initially the teacher would first check he would check us by way of questioning us uh, uh, in order to uh, to ascertain what to, uh, what type of individual we are whether we are rather of the uh, Hinayana type, simply seeking protection from suffering <coughs> for our own sakes, or whether we are uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Mahayana type, uh, having the motivation of uh, going for refuge until we achieve enlightenment, awakening of Buddhahood, not only for our own sakes, but for the sake of all beings. This would be the, um, the uh, more special way of uh, receiving such refuge. Now, during the actual ritual itself, the little ceremony that is being conducted by way of taking refuge, that in itself may not be that obvious. Uh, it all lies in the wording, in the formulation, and which we would have to listen to. For instance, as pertains to time, if uh, the, uh, the, we would repeat words to the effect of from now <coughs> to the end of our life, and so forth, that would pertain rather to the more ordinary type of refuge. Whereas if the uh, words that the master uses uh, include words to the effect of uh, from now until we ourselves achieve Buddhahood for the sake of all beings, that would be an indicator that we are taking refuge according to the uh, Mahayana type, to the uh, type of the greater being. Next is the explanation about the, the various uh, benefits or functions that, uh, uh, that um, going for refuge in such a way brings about, both again being explained on the, uh, uh, as pertaining to a practitioner of the, you know, who has a lesser motivation or as a practitioner who has a uh, higher um, um, motivation. This also includes uh, the, various kinds of, uh, uh, the various kinds of precepts that such a practitioner takes. And then finally, there would be also the explain, uh, an, an explanation about the uh, uh, the actual benefits and the shortcomings of not using this opportunity, of not going for refuge in such a way, of uh, letting this opportunity pass to place oneself under the protection in this particular way. So in this way, all the various points uh, uh, that uh, explain the meaning, the benefits and so forth of going for refuge in either the one or the other way are being explained point by point. There is also the point which I omitted, which explains how we are being protected from various kinds of shortcomings by way of going for refuge. How such refuge uh, protects us uh, from, uh, uh, from various uh, wrong views and ideas, how it protects us from uh, performing certain deeds, for instance, uh, which, which are influenced by wrong views, how it protects us from falling under the influence of people who um, uphold such wrong views, for instance, that there is no such thing as cause and effect, that there is no need to follow the way of the Buddha because it's all not true. There is the explanation about how uh, we are protected uh, uh, in this way, particularly from falling into the lower realms by way of uh, uh, subscribing to such views and falling under the sway of those who, uh, who are proponents of these views. Um, and the various uh, other shortcomings which, uh, which could be uh, which which could be experienced in such ways. Now this concludes the explanation of the first seven points. Now there is the eighth and the ninth points, uh, which deal with that which has to be trained in. 
and the benefits thereof. These two points are, again, uh, somewhat more detailed, and there's no time to go into them now. We will hear about them tomorrow. Excellent.